guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering sensory alterations. Now, as you can see, I've had a little bit of technical difficulties, but in nursing, guess what? The show must go on. So what do you do? You improvise. So guess what? I'm going to make it do what it do, and we're going to go ahead and get started with these questions. Question number one. What is an involuntary motion of retracting the body from painful stimuli? A, sensation, B, reception, C, perception, or D, reaction. If you're new to my channel, go ahead and just press the pause button to give yourself adequate time to look at the questions, think about your answer, and once you think you have the right answer, just press play and we'll continue. So the correct answer, guys, is D, reaction. This is how a patient reacts to painful stimuli. So in the question, we see that the patient did what? They retracted their body away from the painful stimuli. They were reacting to that painful stimuli. So now let's talk about the wrong answer choices. One, sensation. Sensation, guys, is actually a combination of reception, perception, and reaction. So it, it's a combination of B, C, and D. It's really, um, all three that brings awareness to the patient of that stimuli. So that is sensation. B, reception, that's receiving that stimuli and creating a nerve impulse. Choice C, perception, that's how the patient interprets the stimuli, such as, ouch, that really hurt, or ooh, that felt really good. So it's how that patient actually um, perceives that stimulus. All right, next question. A nurse is caring for a patient with a nursing diagnosis of hearing deficit related to presbycusis. Which assessment of the patient would indicate an adaptation to the sensory deficit? A, the patient frequently cleans out his ears with a cotton swab. B, the patient turns one ear towards the nurse during conversation. C, the patient isolates himself from social situations. Or D, the patient asks the nurse to speak loudly during conversations. And the correct answer is B, the patient turns one ear towards the nurse during conversation. So what's happening? The patient is adapting to that sensory deficit. So since their hearing is decreased in one ear, they're turning the good ear towards the nurse so that they can hear better. So the patient themselves, they're doing something that promotes independence, right? They're adapting well, they're adjusting um, to that deficit. Now let's look at our other answer choices. You have A, the patient frequently uh, cleans out his ears with a cotton swab. Well, them cleaning out their ears with a cotton swab, that's not gonna increase the hearing because remember, the problem is presbycusis, not um, cerumen impaction, right? Choice three, the patient isolates themselves from social situations. Well, that's not adaptive behavior. That's maladaptive behavior. We don't want the patient isolating themselves because their hearing is decreased. No, we want them to do things that will promote their independence and help them adapt to the deficit. So that's wrong. And then you have choice D, the patient asks the nurse to speak loudly during conversation. Well, guess what? They're asking the nurse to do something. They're not doing something differently themselves. Adaptive behavior is when the patient themselves, they are doing something to adapt to the deficit. So when you tell the nurse to speak louder, the nurse is doing something, not the patient themselves. So the correct answer is the patient. When they turn their head, they turn towards a good ear so that they can hear better. The nurse would be most concerned about the risk of malnutrition for a patient with which sensory deficit? A, xerostomia, B, disequilibrium, C, cataracts, or D, peripheral neuropathy. And the correct answer is xerostomia, A. 
If the patient has dry mouth, they're most likely not going to want to eat because it's very uncomfortable. Do you realize that it's those enzymes in the saliva that help to break down the food? So it's not just chewing, it's the saliva and the enzymes that are in saliva that helps break down the food so it's easier to swallow and easier to digest when it gets in the stomach. So if the patient has um, decreased saliva, they have a dry mouth, it's going to be uncomfortable for them to eat. So that's what the patient we're going to be worried about um, the risk of malnutrition. Now, choice B, disequilibrium. For that, we'd really be worried about safety. We'd be worried about the patient falling. C, cataracts. If their vision's decrease, we'd worry about them falling. D, peripheral neuropathy. Um, for that, we'd worry about uh, safety, about them burning because they may not feel if the water's too hot, them having sensory deprivation. We may worry about skin breakdown. We may even worry about a secondary infection from skin breakdown but not really malnutrition. The only one that would increase the risk of malnutrition is choice A, that patient with xerostomia. Which of the following sensory changes are normal with aging? A, impaired night vision. B, difficulty hearing low pitch. C, increase in taste discrimination. Or D, heightened sense of smell. And the correct answer, guys, is impaired night vision. So what you tend to see in the older population because the their um, night vision becomes decreased and um, they get more of a glare at nighttime, you'll find that these patients, even if they're independent, they'll drive during the daylight hours when the sun's out and they can see better, but during nighttime, they won't drive or they'll have a family member or friend drive them somewhere if they need to drive because the night vision decreases. Now, um, let's talk about the wrong answer choices. Choice B, difficulty hearing a low pitch. Actually, with the older geriatric population, they have difficulty hearing high pitches, not low pitches. Then you have choice C, increase in taste discrimination. No, they have a decrease in taste discrimination. They lose, they start to lose um, that sense of taste becomes decreased. And then heightened sense of smell, mm-mm. Their sense of smell becomes decreased just like the sense of taste. A nurse is caring for a patient who recently had a stroke and is going to be discharged at the end of the week. The nurse notices that the patient is having difficulty with attempting to eat his meal and is becoming tearful. The nurse includes which intervention in the patient's plan of care? A, teach the patient about special devices used to assist patients with eating meals. B, order the patient food that does not require utensils. C, place a consult for a home health nurse. Or D, obtain an order for antidepressant medication. So the correct answer is going to be A, you're going to teach the patient about special devices used to assist patients with eating meals. Why? We want to promote independence and we want to promote what? Adaptive behavior. So the patient's going to use what? Adaptive devices to eat. Come on. That was an easy one. So let's look at the wrong choices. B, order food that does not require utensils. So we're going to treat them like a baby now. They're only going to have finger foods. Come on, no. We want adaptive behaviors, not maladaptive behaviors. We don't want them to avoid doing things that they used to do in order to avoid that sensory deficit. No, we want them to learn how to live with that sensory de deficit. We don't want maladaptive behaviors. We want adaptive behaviors. So that's wrong. Choice C, place a consult for the home health nurse. Excuse me? What did I tell you about passing the buck? You do not pass the buck. If there's something that you can do for your patient, you do it for your patient. You don't pass it on to somebody else. Come on. You know that's not the answer. Then you have the last choice, obtain an order for antidepressant medication. The problem is not really depression. That's not what the problem is. The problem is the patient has not learned yet how to adapt to the sensory deficit, but it's your job to teach them. So the correct answer is A. Which nursing diagnosis addresses psychological concerns for a patient with both hearing and a visual impairment? A, self-care deficit. B, risk for falls. 
C, social isolation, or D, impaired physical mobility? And the correct answer is C, social isolation. That is the only choice that actually addresses the psychological aspects. So what happens is the patient's hearings decrease, their visions decrease. They stop doing things that they used to like doing, that they used to enjoy doing. They stop going out to dinner with friends because they're embarrassed that they might have to ask the friend to repeat themselves or they stop going to the theater or anything else that they used to like to do. This kind of reminds me of, I'm about to age myself guys, but I love Golden Girls. That's my favorite show. I'd watch it every single night. I watch the reruns. Once they stop playing the reruns on Hallmark, thank goodness it's on Hulu now. So I keep watching it over and over on Hulu. I love Golden Girls. But there was an ep episode where Dorothy, her hearing was decreased and she had to wear a hearing aid. And she was embarrassed about having to wear the hearing aid. So she just stopped doing things that she enjoyed doing, such as going to see the Philharmonic, going to the, um, watching an orchestra, or no, listening to an orchestra, I should say. She stopped doing things that she enjoyed doing. She did what? Social isolation. That is maladaptive behavior. We want the patient to have adaptive behavior, such as what? Using their hearing aid. So that's the correct answer. C, social isolation. Choices A, B, and D all ref um, refer to um, our examples of physical properties, but not so much psychological. A patient informs the nurse that she often becomes nauseated when riding in motor vehicles. The nurse knows that this is related to which sensory deficit? A, neurological deficit, B, visual deficit, C, hearing deficit, or D, balance deficit. Okay, so the correct answer, guys, is D, balance deficit. So disequilibrium, guys, can cause nausea and vomiting. Now, this is a vestibular um, issue, and you guys know where that's located, where in the middle ear, okay? So the whole point is that disequilibrium makes you feel like this, and you feel like this, like the world is spinning. You have that balance deficit makes you want to, what? Vomit makes you nauseous. So the correct answer is D. It's not a brain issue. It's not neuro, visual, or hearing. The, it has nothing to do with how they hear. It has nothing to do with what, they, what they're seeing, not the brain. It's um, actual a balance issue, okay? Which nursing assessment best measures cognitive functioning? A, administer a mini mental status exam. B, ask the patient his name, where he is, and what month it is. C, ask the patient's family if the patient is behaving normally. D, evaluate the patient's ability to read the newspaper. So the correct answer is A, the MMSE. That is the number one way to evaluate the patient's cognitive functioning. What does cognitive functioning mean? That means how a patient thinks, okay? So you wanna evaluate that, you're gonna do the MMSE. And you guys will learn more about that in psych. I actually, I haven't done psych questions with you guys in a long time. Maybe my next couple of videos will be psych, but you'll learn more about that in psych. Choice two, ask the patient the name, where he is, the month of it, month it is. That actually will tell you more about that patient's um, orientation, not so much as their, their cognitive functioning. Choice C, asking the family member if the patient's behaving normally. For a situation like this, the family member is not reliable. You want to know how the patient's thinking. And then choice D, evaluate the patient's ability to read the newspaper. Well, reading the newspaper, they can just pick up the newspaper and just read it. But that really does not tell you what they're thinking or how they're thinking about what they read, which tells you their level of cognitive function. The nurse would utilize the Snellen chart for assessment of which patient? A, a patient who's having difficulty remembering how to perform familiar tasks. B, a patient who turns the television up as loud as possible. C, a patient who holds his newspaper two inches from his face. Or D, a patient who frequently reports the incorrect time from the clock across the room.
And the correct answer is D. The patient who um, reports the incorrect time from the clock across the room. So first of all, guys, whenever you see um, that word Snellen chart to the front forefront of your mind, I want you to think of visual acuity because that's what the Snellen chart tests, the patient's visual acuity, all right? So with that being said, you should have gotten rid of A and B because A, that measures the patient's mental status when you're asking, when the patient's having difficulty remembering things that they do often, things that are repetitive and all of a sudden they're forgetting. You're going to really, really what you want to measure for that would be the mental status. B, the patient that t um, turns up the television as loud as possible, that's a, what kind of problem is that? That's hearing, all right? That's not visual acuity. So you should have gotten rid of A and B automatically. That leaves you with C and D. Here's how you should have known the answer was D and not C. Whenever you're using a Snellen chart to measure the patient's visual acuity, where do you have the patient stand? 20 feet away. 20 feet away. They have to stand 20 feet away from the chart that they're reading. Remember, perfect vision is what? 20, 20. The patient can see at 20 feet what the nor um, re normal, regular um, vision of a person can see at 20 feet, okay? 20, 20. So look at C. The patient holds a newspaper two inches to their face. What would you be testing for that? You'd be testing for nearsightedness, okay? But look at D. The patient reports incorrect time from the uh, clock where? Across the room. That's farther, so that would be, could possibly be what? At least 20 feet, maybe farther, maybe less, but around there at least, it's not two inches. So that's what made you choose, sh made you should have choose, I should say, D instead of C. The nurse is creating a plan of care for a patient with glaucoma. Which nursing diagnosis addresses the complication of sensory deficit that places the patient at greatest risk for injury? A, risk for falls. B, body image disturbance. C, social isolation. Or D, fear. And the correct answer is risk for falls because we're looking for something that could increase the risk for injury. That patient have risk for falls. So let's, I want you to think about it, guys. Patients got glaucoma. What is glaucoma? Increased ocular pressure, right? That increased ocular pressure will cause what? Decreased vision. If a patient has decreased vision, they're at risk for what? Falls, of course, okay? Because if their vision's decreased, chances are they'll have a problem with depth perception, which increases their risk for falls. Now, you see B, C, and D. B, C, and D are all diagnoses that can go with glaucoma, but the question's very specific. We're looking for something that would be what? Um, risk for injury. And out of A, B, C, and D, risk for falls is the only one that the patient obviously would be at risk for injuring themselves. The nurse is caring for a patient who is having difficulty understanding written and spoken word. The nurse suspects the patient has blank aphasia. A, expressive, B, receptive, C, Broca's, or D, Wernicke's. So the correct answer, guys, is B, receptive. Receptive is understanding of spoken or written communication. Let's go through our wrong choices. You have A, expressive. That is actually being able to speak or write, expressing yourself. Choice C and D, Broca's and Wernicke's, those are both areas of the brain where language is processed, all right? But th those are not, um, uh, it doesn't explain or give the definition of being able to understand written or sp spoken language, which is receptive, okay? The nurse is caring for a patient with conductive hearing loss resulting from prolonged cerumen impaction. Which intervention by the nurse is most important in establishing communication with the patient? A, speaking in a loud voice, enunciating every syllable. 
B, having direct conversation with the patient in his affected ear. C, if the patient does not understand what the nurse is saying, repeating the phrase again. Or D, speaking with hands, face, and expressions. And the correct answer is D, speaking with hands, face, and expression. So to help the client understand what you're saying, you're going to give them verbal cues. You're going to move your hands. You may point to something. You may have a picture of something you want them to look at, right? You're going to give them verbal cues to help facilitate understanding. Now let's talk about the wrong answer choices. A, sp stop it. Speaking in a loud voice, all that's going to do is annoy and irritate the patient. You want to speak at a normal um, tone, a normal voice, okay? B, having direct conversation with the patient in the affected ear. Why would you speak into the affected ear? That's the ear that they can't hear out of. Why would you do that? So we know that's wrong, right? Okay. Choice C, if the patient doesn't understand what the nurse is saying, repeating the phrase again. So help me understand, if they didn't understand what you said the first time, how is repeating it going to make them miraculously understand it the second time? No, what you want to do is rephrase it. So maybe they didn't understand it the first time. Rephrase what you were trying to say then maybe they'll understand it in another way. But just repeating yourself over and over again is not going to make the patient understand what you're trying to say. All right? So the correct answer is speaking with your hands, jazz hands, right? Speaking with your face, using verbal cues. You may use a picture. That is what um, would be most helpful to the patient. The home health nurse is caring for a patient with a tactile deficit. The nurse is concerned about injury related to inability to feel harmful stimuli. The nurse evaluates that the patient is able to safely care for himself when the patient demonstrates which action. A. Places colored stickers on faucet handles to indicate temperature and keep a thermometer near the tub. B. Ask the nurse to test the temperature of the water before entering the bath. C, replaces all lace-up shoes with Velcro ones and purchases shampoo caps. D, dispenses all medications into a plate for easy access in the morning. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, so the correct answer is A, then placing color stickers on faucet handles to indicate temperature and keep a thermometer near the tub. So this is the correct answer because what is the patient doing? In the, it's promoting their independence, right? But they're taking steps to remind themselves of danger so they don't get harmed, so they don't injure themselves. So this is the correct um, answer because they're adapting correctly. Okay, let's look at our other choices. You have B, asking the nurse to test the temperature. So is that nurse gonna be with them 24 hours a day every time they need to take a bath? We want to know what the patient, what themselves, are, what they're doing to promote their independence, what they're doing to adapt to that sensory deficit, not what they can ask somebody else to do for them. Choice uh, C, replacing all lace-up shoes with Velcro. Velcro's good. And one, and one purchases shampoo caps. Excuse me. Velcro ones and purchases shampoo caps. Um, I have no idea what the shampoo caps have to do with this. I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. But Velcro's very good. Velcro's good. Um, zippers are good. But when you have to choose between um, the Velcro instead of the laces and them burning themselves, the priority is going to be what? Them not burning themselves, right? Because um, even though we like the Velcro over the shoelaces, it's really just the difference of the patient. Can they tie their shoelaces or will it take them longer versus using Velcro versus the first one, the temperature, that patient actually burning themselves. So that's going to take priority, okay? 
choice d dispenses all medication to play for easy access in the morning that's very dangerous patient wakes up the next morning and they got all these pills on the plate on the table they don't remember what they were supposed to take in the morning what they were supposed to take in the afternoon they don't remember which medications which which medication they're supposed to eat with food which one without no we don't want that so the correct answer is that patient that's putting color stickers on the faucet they have the thermometer they have those physical visual cues to remind them so that they don't injure themselves so that they can stay safe Often blindness occurs during childhood. Which health preventative measure is most appropriate to prevent vision impairment? A, screen young children early for visual impairments. B, instruct parents to report reduced eye contact from their child immediately. C, include rubella and syphilis screening in the preconception care plan. Or D, administer prophylactic antibiotics to all newborns. And the correct answer, guys, is C, include rubella and syphilis screening in the preconception stage. So before mommy's even pregnant, right, we do those screenings. We start teaching them, right? Because guess what? Rubella, uh, syphilis, that can cause blindness in utero as that fetus is developing, Okay, so that is a wonderful answer for prevention. Now let's look at our other choices. We have A, screening young children early for visual impairments. Screening them early, all that will do um, will detect the issue early, but it won't prevent anything. It'll just give you early detection. We're looking for prevention, not early detection. B, instruct the parents to report reduced eye contact from the child immediately. Again, that will help you detect vision issues early, but it will not prevent vision issues. Choice D, administering prophylactic antibiotics to all newborns. Well, here's the thing. That's not appropriate. The antibiotic ointments that we give to the patient, to the um, newborns, um, that's for patients, for example, that um, moms had an active STI, okay? So that does not, we don't give the antibiotics to all newborns, that's not appropriate. So the correct answer for this is the screening for the rubella for the syphilis done when? Preconception, before mom is even pregnant. The nurse is caring for a patient in acute respiratory distress. The patient has multiple monitoring systems on that constantly beep and make noise. The patient is becoming agitated and frustrated over inability to sleep. What action by the nurse is most appropriate for this patient? A, provide the patient with a therapeutic back rub. B, turn off the alarms on the monitoring system. C, administer an opioid medication to help the patient sleep. Or D, provide the patient with earplugs. And the correct answer is D, provide the patient with earplugs. And this is a great answer because um, you're helping promote the patient's sleep without messing with any of the devices, right? So let's look at our wrong choices. A, provide the patient with a therapeutic back rub. Well, the problem isn't pain. The problem is that they can't go to sleep because of all that beeping noise. So even after you give them the back rub, they're still gonna hear the beeping noise. Ch Turn off the alarms on the monitoring system? Are you crazy? I know you. I know you didn't pick that. I just know you didn't. So we're going to keep moving because I know you didn't. Choice C, administer an opioid medication to help the patient sleep. Well, opioids are for moderate to severe pain, right? Not for sleep. So we're not going to give a patient an opioid just to help them go to sleep. Absolutely not. You're going to give the patient earplugs so they can't hear the beeping noise. All right, guys, we are down to our last question. What nursing action can the nurse implement to comfort an elderly patient with sensory deprivation to improve meaningful stimuli? A, placing a do not disturb sign on the patient's door. B, offering the patient a back rub. 
C, asking the patient if he would like a newspaper to read. Or D, placing the patient in the room farthest from the nurse's station. So the correct answer is B, offering the patient a back rub. So this patient is suffering from sensory deprivation. And the question is asking us, what can we do to give a meaningful stimuli? If they're, if they're suffering from sensory deprivation, they need somebody around them, talking with them, interacting with them. That's what's meaningful, okay? Touching them, okay? That physical contact, the emotional contact, getting them engaged, right? So offering a patient a back rub, yeah. Because physically touching them, that's off offering physical stimulus, right? Let's look at our other choices. One, placing a do not disturb sign on the patient's door. That is going to worsen the sensory deprivation that this patient already has. They need that interaction. Troy C, asking them if they'd like to read a newspaper. That's not meaningful stimuli. You're giving them a newspaper for them to read. They're not engaging. They're not interacting with anybody. That's not meaningful. And then choice D, placing them farthest away from the nurse's station. That's going to increase that deficit. They're not have, getting enough um, stimulus, and that would be making it even worse. All right, guys. So that is it for sensory alterations. Um, I hope you guys found this video helpful. Please don't forget to share this video with anyone that you think would benefit from it. Do not forget to like and subscribe below. And of course, press that red bell. That's the notification button to let you know every time a new video is released. Thank you so much for spending this time with me and I'll see you on the next video.